Thank you, everyone. I'd like to just say a few very brief words. My name is Philip Mader. Uh, Digitax, the program which is hosting this uh, session, is a research program that aims to generate knowledge and evidence to advise and support governments and other stakeholders at overcoming challenges and identifying opportunities at the interface of digital financial services, digital IDs, and tax. We have a particular focus on Africa. Digitax is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I'll hand over in a few seconds to Chris Wales, who is our chair for today's session. Um, in the world of tax, Chris hardly needs an introduction. Um, so all I'll say is uh, he was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors for the UK government, a previous one, not the current one, that's worth pointing out. And uh, he has worked with prime ministers and finance ministers in many countries around the world on economic and fiscal issues. So it's a real pleasure to have uh, Chris uh, sharing this discussion today with our three extremely distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, with that, over to you, Chris. Taxes and levies don't happen by accident. They happen because governments believe they are desirable or necessary, usually necessary. The government of Ghana decided that there should be a levy on certain electronic transfers of funds. How was that decision made? Who was involved? What analysis preceded the decision? Um, why did the e-levy take this particular form? the targeted transactions, the rate, the exclusions, the unusual dependence on technology. This is an opportunity to explore these issues. There will be four sections in today's webinar. First, we ask our panelists about the design of the e-levy. How does it work? What is it intended to achieve? What are the strengths and weaknesses of the levy's design? Then we ask the panelists to turn the spotlight on the process. How do we get here? Is the design an inevitable reflection of the process that produced it? In the third section, we will take questions from participants. So the fourth section of the, uh, of the webinar uh, involves asking the panelists, what could be different? What should be different? Can we learn from local knowledge? Can we learn from the experience of similar levies that have been made elsewhere in the world? So uh, I think we're in for a very interesting discussion. Let me go straight to introducing the panelists who all bring a high level of knowledge and expertise to this discussion. Seth Turper. Seth is uh, probably best known to um, to people in Ghana as a former Minister of Finance. Um, so he brings very much an insider's view on the way in which tax policy is developed in Ghana and has enormous knowledge of uh, the processes and the analysis that usually underpins tax policy making in Ghana. He's a chartered accountant by profession, and he's currently an advisor and senior consultant at the African Development Institute of the African Development Bank. Eileen Rafferty is a regional tax advisor in West Africa, working for the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. She has rich experience in different aspects of tax policy in the region and has been involved as a member of the, the of our own Digitax working group. Abdullah, Dr. Abdullah Ali Nache is a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana's School of Law. He has more than 30 years experience working on taxation. Uh, he works extensively in private practice and in academia. He is a member of the Ghana Bar Association, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana, the Institute of Internal Auditors, Ghana, and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Taxation, Ghana. So between our three panelists, we, um, we have a huge amount of expertise. I'm looking forward to hearing what they say uh, on the levy, and um, I'm sure you will be too. So let's um let's make a start on the first issue which is about the design of the the levy and let me give the microphone first of all to abdullah 
um, and ask him for his thoughts about uh, about how it works and whether it really works, and um, and share some of his his knowledge about uh, about the design of the the tax with us. Abdullah. I think that the idea behind the e-levy was more of an attempt by the government of Ghana to try to show up its revenue collection, especially when in the region, best performing countries are looking at 20% tax GDP ratio when Ghana is in the region of 12 to 13%. So government taught it as one of the tax handles to introduce to be able to increase its revenue base by way of broadening the tax net. But in so doing, the reasons for looking at this tax handle was anchored on the fact that government wanted to look at developing entrepreneurship, also trying to look at youth employment, okay. finally also looking at road infrastructure, which was the reason why government abolished the road levy that we had. The, the challenge with the design had to do more with the the rate at which it was being introduced at the time, which was about 1.75. And with agitation, it was brought down to 1.5%. And there were also challenges to do with the threshold that people could be exempt from the application of the e-levy. And so all in all, you realize that since it was rolled out, it has not been able to attain the targeted revenue of about 6.9 billion Ghana cities that the government was intending to collect. Currently, they are making about only 7% of what they intended to collect. So it has come with challenges in terms of bringing in the needed revenue for which it was intended. So in a nutshell, that is what the issues have been as far as the e-levy is concerned. Thank you, Abdullah. I'm going to turn to Seth now. And Seth, I'm, I want you to, to maybe address a couple of issues. Do you think that there are problems with the, the design of the tax in terms of um, what's excluded from it? Do you think that's at the heart of why the revenues have been so arguably disappointing in um, uh, in from the government's perspective. Do you think um, threat the threshold was right? Where, what do you think about the design of the tax, of the levy? My, my perspective is um, the coverage of the tax, which is a design issue. Uh, is it on income? Is it on consumption? Is it even on loan? Or is it on investments? Because the tax is imposed any time there's a transfer. And therefore, there was a scramble to begin to exclude certain transactions so because it's, it was found to be, you know, difficult if I go for a loan and the mere fact that I am, you know, transferring by means of electronic means, you impose a tax on it. You know, there's a fairness question also. If two of us are paid, you know, we pay PAYE, I put my money in my pockets, you know, I buy and there's no tax. You know, somebody puts his money in a leather wallet, buys, and there's no tax. Immediately, I put money on the phone. That's where the young people, and I buy the same commodity. I pay the conventional, you know, uh, VAT. I pay which all of us have to pay, but in addition, I then pay a digital tax. So what is it that we are taxing? If I, you know, uh, take a loan to pay my employees to build, a, make an investment, and I transfer money electronically to, you know, a, an architect or to my workers, you know, I'm taxed on a loan. Have we come to the point where we have to tax loans and investments? And so, uh, the vet, by virtue of the fact that you are dealing with a mere transfer, and that is where the difficulty of what to include and what to exclude, you know, came in, and so the days had to be narrowed, and then you have You've had this difficulty. The second perspective I'd like to, to point out on a policy perspective is that E-Levy is not in iso an isolated, you know, levy. We have about 12, you know, levies. And it includes the straight levy, which used on a, what we call the GET Fund and the NHIL, which used to be in the VAT base. And therefore, you had credit and you had refunds. Now it's been made a levy. And therefore, 
as anybody who is familiar with VAT, sorry to be technical, cascading, because you are blocking, you know, uh, refunds, you are blocking the conventional credit that comes with the inverse credit method. You know, so that is it. Then we also have environmental levies. You know, we have uh, what used to be temporary taxes that were brought in whenever there's crisis, like the FinSec, which remains, and then you impose another, you know, levy. You know, I can go on and on. So uh, we are not, often we discuss the yield levy as if it is, you know, one tax in isolation. It only came, happened to have come in after COVID, and therefore there was a lot of talk, you know, getting into, you know, Russia, Ukraine. So we had a lot of, uh, but there were these benign introductions of about 12, 13 levies. So is it that is the policy to use levies, you know, to, you know, to, to, to do what, to achieve what? And my last point is historically, we must remember that Ghana used to have levies, Ghana used to have super sales taxes, Ghana used to have, you know, and that's the whole essence of the ERP SAP, the Washington Consensus, which rationalized and removed many of these distortions and therefore came up with, you know, four or five pillars, which is the income tax, PAYE, you know, and the <clears throat> PAYE self-employed taxes and the corporate income tax. And then you go to VAT. VAT, remember, in fact, we used to have about, you know, selected about 12 or 13 services, including electronic, you know, including even a TV, digital TV, including a mobile phone, you know, communication where they came in. All of these were put together in an all-inclusive VAT. So what are we doing with 11? Are we going back, you know, to the old regime? And I like to, you know, policy, you know, uh, analysts to look at the perspective, the distortion, significant distortion that is, that is taking place. And then if you look at another policy point, well, if digital is new and if digital is, is emerging and is very significant, doesn't it deserve incentive? Why do we rather put punitive taxes? And at the same time that this tax was coming in, you know, uh, uh, sectors that have had been in existence for 30 years, 20 years, financial and others, you know, were having extensions of their, you know, their incentives. Significant incentives were being given to the automobile industry and whatever. These are struggling, well structured. You know, and then you rather have a new emerging, you know, a economy which is struggling already with e-commerce issues with, you know, in the international space, you know, and, and you want to create more distortion. You know, so I think for the policy perspective, I think the tax is confusing, you know, and, and no doubt it is encouraging evasion and avoidance, quite apart from the points that uh, Dr. Nacha made, and is therefore not bringing in the revenue. I can see, I can tell that this is quite an emotive issue for you and uh, uh, and a levy that you have quite a lot of concerns about. It's a technical more than emotive one. <laughs> Eileen, let me bring you in then and ask you about uh, about the design of the the levy. I know your brief is uh, is broader than just Ghana. So, um, how do you how do you see the levy, the design of the levy, compared with um, some other kind of international experience? What what is your sense about the the way in which it's been designed? So I think my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues, have, have raised a number of really important points about the levy. Um, but I, I think. Uh, one of the issues, and an undoubted issue, is the the, the rate. Um, I, I think few people would argue that, assuming you were going, you'd made the policy decision to bring in a levy, 1.75% was too high, and 1.5%, I think, is still too high. It, it adds to the market distortion and the incentive to avoid. So uh, it, I, I think the evidence generally is that you could have, if you'd had a smaller percentage, say half a percent, and a broader base levy, you would still have had <coughs> resistance and, and some quite reasonable resistance. There would still have been policy design issues, but perhaps it would have overall had a more successful introduction. Um, uh, I think also uh, initially when the levy was announced in the 20, November 2011 budget, it was a, it was a broad base levy. Some of the exemptions were necessary, as, as Mr. Turkper has said, to, to make the levy work at all. You have to exclude um, 
the transactions in a chain when it's a single transaction, but there are multiple people who make it happen and stuff like that. Some are essential. And you can't also have, uh, it would be quite difficult if you didn't exempt payments to government so that you were actually paying a tax on your tax. Um, so there are some that are necessary. Other exemptions that were introduced um, uh, have, uh, have made it relatively easy to avoid the levy, particularly if you're banked, um, uh, but not exclusively then. People who, who, who operate only in cash can also avoid it. So there are a number of challenges. You can see again why some of those, those exemptions are in place. Um, uh, and you can argue about some of the other ones. The point about market distortion is an issue which has come up in other jurisdictions. I know it was raised particularly when um, the levy was introduced in Uganda and was part of the, the, the there was a perception that it, it did significant damage to the industry in Uganda because it, it, it taxed only part of money transfers and not that kind of wider market. So there are a whole, there are a range of challenges with the design. Um, but overall, I think it, it, it's, it's a combination of a high rate and quite a lot of exemptions, assuming the government has made the decision to have that levy in the first place. A, a stronger design might have been a smaller percentage and a, 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 a more broad based application, which would have been perhaps fairer. But there are many difficult design challenges as well in, in implementing such a levy. All very interesting points that have been made so far. Uh, before we leave the, the area of design of the tax, I just want to ask the panellists uh, a couple of more specific issues. Um, and I'll come to Abdallah first, if I may. Uh, what is the? What do you feel about the the rationale for excluding international remittances, cross border remittances from from the levy? Let me ask, pose that as as question one and as question two. Um, the levy excludes the um, the first hundred CDs of um, okay. of transfers that an individual makes in certain circumstances. Um, uh, which means that somebody who makes a transfer on day one of 200 um, is subjected to the levy, but somebody who makes a transfer of 100 on successive days isn't subject to the levy. What do you think about the fairness <coughs> aspect of that? What do you think about the um, <coughs> about the design of a tax that has a, a differential impact on uh, on two people who are arguably in very similar positions? I think the that is one of the challenges of the tax design. In body may have been mixing up the issue of taxation of e-commerce with e-levy. Electronic definitely does not mean you are doing business. If indeed you are targeting those earning income from e-commerce or trading on social media, then the tax point should be at the receiving end and not the transfer point. <clears throat> the recipient should then have been the one to suffer the levy. And that is how it has impacted on the international transfer being excluded because the levy is at the transfer point, the person effecting the transfer. If it was on the recipient, then the international transfers could have been captured because then I'm here receiving it. But if it is on the one transferring, he is out of the jurisdiction. So obviously, he is not caught in the design. Then talking about the, the piecemeal transfers because of the threshold of a hundred, it is the reason why people were of the view that the threshold was rather too low we could have considered a threshold where cumulatively you could be looking at a 500 Ghana cities. Then it will not bring in the issue of doing intermittent transfers of 100 today, wait till tomorrow, and I'll still be within the exemption, then I will transfer. So that is all part of the failure in the design mechanism. And let me say again that these are, no, these are not uh, new issues. These are the issues that confronted the introduction of VAT. International transactions, that's why you zero rate, you know, otherwise you are exporting your tax. I mean, it's as simple as that. Assuming that it's a transaction tax, you know, then you may impose on it, but then you are, you are simply, and then the second point is, 
you know, also um, as a destination rule, you do have where you do the variation, you know, and you change it in the case of supply of services. And that is the reason, you know, you are having difficulty considering that digital is already having a, a hard time, as uh, Dr. Lee said, you are dealing with, uh, <laughs> um, uh, as he said, you know, you are dealing with e-commerce, you know, because once the transaction is, is on a transaction, <laughs> sorry, once the levy is on a transaction, it's mimicking VAT, you know, basically, and therefore the supply, place of supply issues and all those principles come into play, you know, and therefore you struggle to go and bring VAT principles, you know, for this. The threshold issue, let's remember, it's not just to solve the transaction because the sector is dominated, you know, by very small, you know, uh, we, that's why we call the Momo tax and the umbrella tax. You know, small people sitting in street corners, you know, and uh, being the intermediaries who are doing the transfer, right? I mean, these are, uh, these are again the VAT reason why you have a VAT threshold. That's why you keep small businesses out of the threshold. You know, otherwise you just, you know, the cost of compliance become very high, you know, and everywhere in Accra on street corners and everywhere in villages, you have, you know, all these people. You know, what is the capacity of GRA to bring all of these people into the system? Yes, so again, yes, you, are mimicking, you, are mimicking, you are mimicking VAT, you know, because it's basically on this point, it's a, it's a, it's a consumption tax. Basically, that's what it is. And, yeah. and then it says, so what is the difference between this, you know, and the VAT on non-core financial services or that was introduced? The VAT is already on services. Because of the technical difficulty, no cost financial services were brought in. And basically, money on wallets and all those things, immediate transaction is a form of financial transaction, you know, because it's, it's just a banking, you know, regulation. So, so I, I just like to, this is the point. Yeah, the design, you know, is flawed and know that we are running into the same principles that we struggled with, you know, with the design of VAT. Thank you, Seth. <coughs> Ellen, do you want to add anything to, to the comments that have been made by other panelists? I think. There's one key difference with, with broader VAT, which is that the levy is implemented by a relatively small number of highly regulated people automatically. And I think this was part, my guess, and I don't know, is that this will have been part of the attraction for government. Often, and I speak for the, my time in the UK policy as well as from what I've seen here, it, it's attractive to government if it's going to bring in something new to bring in something relatively easy to implement and and relatively easy can be if you have a small number of people who will be charged with implementing it and you should uh, there are lots of taxes like uh, insurance premium tax in the uk relatively small number of people breaks in a, a great deal of money um with with fairly limited resource from the revenue authority to implement it so i think that was part i, I would imagine that was part of the thinking in the design. But of course, this is a particularly um, complex type of levy because it is on transfers, as, as uh, Mr. Natch and, and Mr. Turker have so clearly said. So there were lots of design challenges in it. But I do think that the, 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 peop the, the, the fact that it would have been implemented by this relatively small number of, of bodies will have been part of the design and the traction yeah if i may quickly that's a very very important point but remember you know when you talk about those then you are talking about the aggregators those we call the merchants you know who are the ones you know aggregating those small businesses which which i spoke about you know and so uh, you bring the issue of double taxation you tax them and then to the extent that you know those below are also so that's how the tax just, as I said, cascades, you know, so you therefore have to, you know, on, on, on second thought, bring in a very high threshold to take out the small ones because then you can collect the tax at the aggregation level, you know, I, I mean, setting <laughs> aside all the points I raised earlier, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much to, to all three of you. Um, let's change the focus now a little bit to um, to the process through which the, the, <clears throat> with the levy was designed. Um, Seth, I want to start with you, and um, I know you're particularly familiar with the way in which um, tax policy analysis and uh, decisions are made within the framework of, of the government of Ghana. I've been privileged to work a little bit in that area as well. Um, 
what do you think about the way in which this um uh, this levy was put together do you think it followed the standard process for designing um taxes new taxes in uh in ghana did it follow all the all the normal procedures did it involve in the usual consultations and discussions with participants um and such like um or was it in some way um kind of fast tracked through a uh, a shorter process we're having fiscal challenges no doubt about it and therefore there was a need to plug you know the huge deficits you know at the time it was introduced no question about it but then if you talk about the process obviously the ministry of finance initiates the process you know and then ends up with parliament obviously because no other authority can impose a tax but in between that you have the consultative process and i think that from the reaction from even the industry itself i think there was limited consultation because the telcos the merchants i spoke about and the rest you know banks sort of a sudden began to bring out difficulties and issues so the consultative process could have been a bit deeper you know but the fact that you were you were anxious to block you know a, a fiscal hole you know uh, brought about a certain rush you know about the whole thing and, and one of the reasons why it backfired because then you have you know titans of the industry you know beginning to oppose it you know and uh, that didn't go too well you know for for government as a policy maker Thank you, Seth. Abdullah, what what's um what's your view on on the process here? I mean, clearly the um uh, the tax policy department at the Ministry of Finance normally does a lot of work on um on the analysis of a of a new tax or a new levy. Um it looks very closely at the uh, at the impacts of uh, of changes in existing taxes in this case what do you think about the the work that was done uh, for example on the on the revenue estimates for um for the levy it seems from um from the experience of the first few months that the levy is generating perhaps around 10 percent of the revenues that that were expected from it um do you think that the work was rushed do you think that um there was a proper understanding um of the uh of the issues around the design of the levy that perhaps influenced the uh the estimates that were made do you think there was enough consultation with with the industry to to understand what um what their sense of of the outcome was likely to be Thank you. I think I agree with uh, Honorable Seth. Uh, it's uh, I keep saying that the design of the e levy uh -huh. was more or less a knee jerk reaction to the gaping hole in revenue base. A uh, reason being that, as was observed, a lot of the players and uh, stakeholders got to hear of the levy the day the budget was read. That cannot be said to have been consultative enough because the very players in the industry that could make it possible for government to raise the needed revenue are the telcos, the telecommunication companies. And for them to hear of what it is that is coming up to them on the day the budget is read for me was not adequate for them to reconfigure their systems and even with the banks. I think sometimes people look at the e levy uh -uh. as if it is only on the mobile money transfers, but they forget that where you even make bank transfers exceeding 20,000 Ghana cities, then the electronic transfer levy affects you. And so you would realize that if you did not engage the banks, at what point would they configure their systems to deduct that levy when you have made a transfer exceeding that threshold? So I think the e levy was all for me a knee jerk reaction. Did not get through the extent, did not look at tax equivalences. If we are not getting the budgeted revenue, where else can we look at? Or how should we readjust it? Because for me, as Elin mentioned, the rate was on the high side, 1.5. Even to take a 1% is still on the high side. We could have looked at a 0.5 because it is 0 0.2 in Cote d'Ivoire, and it should, for me, be on the service charges and not the principal amount of a transfer. Because in that case, like uh, Seth mentioned, you are taking money from my pocket because it's as good as a wallet for me. 
And if you have to take any tax, is it on income? Is it on services? We all know the tax base. But if I have my money and you are coming to take part of it, what kind of tax is that? And that is what will bring all the resistance, non-compliance, and the tax planning around it to avoid the payment of the tax. And that affects the revenue expected. And more so, for government to look at the fact that we have about 500 billion in the space, question is, did you desegregate it to see that some are multiples so that if i send five thousand to set set sends two thousand of the five thousand to you and you send one thousand to Elin, are they added all of them up to get to that base they were looking at then they should have seen that it was the same five thousand which was changing hands else you would budget based on a fifteen thousand when the actual base is a five thousand then you will not get the targeted revenue you were expecting. So for me, those were some of the issues that are currently affecting the performance of the e-levy. I mean, quickly on the estimates, um, you, you know, what was surprising was uh, we were doing some analysis, uh, two points. First of all, most people did not realize they thought it was a new tax. But the tax was already factored in the budget. And then we're doing some work on what it would take to increase you know, the total revenue from 16% to 20% as projected at the time. And to our surprise, you know, the million term projection had for every year 1.4% of GDP attributed, you know, to, to the yield levy. I mean, which meant that you can see clearly that this is something that was, you know, otherwise there could have been some variation considering that, you know, uh, GDP moves up and down and, you know, on the consumption base or whatever. But it was 1.4%, you know, for the current year and then during three years, you know, constant. The nominal value varied, but when you express as a percent of GDP, so it tells you clearly that, you know, maybe even the just industry had been consulted, you know, maybe, you know, even JR in their database, you know, something would have been, you know, uh, come up that this may be an ambitious, you know, uh, revenue, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Seth. Um, Eileen, I need to bring you in. And um, I just want to ask you about um, what you think about, for example, consultation in the process for um, for the introduction of the levy, not just consultation with, with the industry, but um, consultation with the, the people who um, who are the ultimately the taxpayers here the people who are who are using the service and who who bear the cost would you have expected that there to have been more consultation with um with that group of people um it's good practice these days when you introduce a new levy or a new tax to um to have an open discussion about the the shape of the tax um you very often as a policymaker will want to establish some principles some um some pillars that are not changeable but uh, it makes sense to to listen to people who will be the taxpayers to understand how they're likely to to react to uh to a new levy or to an increase in the in an existing levy do you feel that um there was adequate consultation there do you feel that the um uh that the institutional consultation was good enough as well obviously one of the key things with um with the e-levy is that uh, it relies very heavily on um on technology it relies on the um the gra being in a position to um to deal with the the technical aspects of the tax to provide information to uh, intermediaries in the in the process what's your i mean what do you think about uh, uh, about the way in which the um the process was carried out here in in these two areas ideally of course you should have a full consultation process for every major change so that you can draw out all the issues um as a matter of, of policy and politics i think when a government is bringing in a significant change which it knows will be likely to be unpopular. They often make a, a calculated decision, again, everywhere in the world, thinking about, you know, if you start talking about it sometime before you implement it, you might get such a backlash that you never implement. So sometimes governments make a decision that they'll just hold off and go big bang, 
because they want to get it through. Those are, those are I, I, I don't know what the thinking was. I'm just sort of thinking out loud, but I, I have personally been involved in, in, in instances where uh, an unpopular policy was brought in. And maybe it was to be brought in in two stages, but you get such a reaction to doing it the first stage, you never can do the second one. So sometimes there's, you know, just, it, it's, it's a decision for governments to make. Um, and good practice in an ideal world certainly is for consultation, um, external consultation to really get a better understanding of what will happen in the real world. <coughs> but as a matter of po public po politics, sometimes governments make different decisions. And I speculate that that might have been part of the thinking in, in this case, because when you know you have to bring in something difficult, it's challenging to do it. Um, on internal consultation, um, I, I know that this was being considered for some time. I know that there will have been internal consultation. My suspicion is partly that, that if you look at the figures, um, the headline, the Bank of Ghana produces a monthly analysis, which includes um, money market, um, uh, mobile money payment figures. And if you look at the figures for the relevant period, and then the amount of tax that, that it was assumed to bring in, it looks like it was assumed that this would capture broadly 80, 85% of all the value on the transactions and i suspect i'm making this point because i think that there was perhaps not enough data available in the beginning to make a, a very good estimate and then you get into the point of how much challenge did people feel able to make upwards and a, a thing which is a particular cultural feature in ghana is that sometimes it's difficult for people to challenge upwards um, to, to, to speak truth to power. It's difficult everywhere. And governments never have to listen to tax officials. At the end of the day, governments will decide what they want to do. But a really good policy process should allow for a robust exchange internally so that at least all the problems are explored by the time they get forward. And I know that the, there are very strong-minded and able colleagues in the Ministry of Finance and in the Revenue Authority and, and um, who have good ability to, to make a good case and to do analysis. I, I just wonder how easy it will have been for them to, 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 to challenge upwards. And I know that in Mr. Turkper's time, he was keen to ensure that the, the, the official's ability to analyse um, to produce good information and to, to send it up the line was 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 um, was increasingly part of the process. And the current Minister of Finance has continued that. And we, the UK, has been very happy to to support um, the ministry and its analytical abilities. But I wonder too if there was if there were some cultural issues. But Mr. Turker and, and Mr. Natcher would be better able than me to really comment on those. I'm just again speculating out loud. We need to move now to the to the Q and A section of this, and there are already a number of interesting questions that that have come in. A couple of them really relate to the to the tax base, the the base on which the um, the levy is 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 levied, um, and uh, and how this compares with with other countries, whether it's reasonable and fair to. Uh, to have a, a levy that is based on the value transferred, a point which was touched on just a little while ago, or whether it would be fairer to, to base it on the charge made by the providers. In other words, um, to, to essentially treat it as a, um, either an additional excise duty, if you like, on the, uh, on the cost of the, the transaction. Um, Maybe I can just start actually again with you, I mean, whether given your international experience, I mean, do you, how do you how, how do you see um, the base for the um, for the levy in Ghana compared with with other places? Is it reasonable to tax uh, value transferred, or is there a, a a different approach that that could be considered and that has been used elsewhere? Um, I think that. That Mr. Parker kind of explored the the basis of the taxation and some of the the tensions in taxing the value uh, the, the payment process itself. So I won't kind of go back 
over those. I think it's hard to do too many comparisons. The, the, the mobile money is a, is a strong feature in, in that, stronger in Africa probably than anywhere else in the world across the, the continent. Um, in Europe in general, a much larger percentage of people are banked. So in, in the UK, only about 4% of people are unbanked. I don't have figures for Ghana, but I know that in Nigeria, it's around about 60%. So, so, so the comparators are really broadly other countries which use uh, mobile payment systems. Um, you could look at, of course, you could look at wider issues of payment systems. You could look at the ability to tax um, financial services transactions around the world. And those are, again, as Mr. Turker said, that there are great difficulties in doing that, even in applying VAT to financial services because of the nature of the service and because often the fee is kind of hidden and so difficult to extract in, in terms of having a consideration and, and so on and so forth. So um, I think there are a lot of challenges in this area, but coming back to the fairness point, I think one of the issues, it's too early yet to say how much impact this has um, on different sectors of society. But if, again, if you look at the Bank of Ghana stats, what you can see is that broadly the numbers of transactions have held up, but the value has reduced a bit. Now, you don't know how many of those smaller transactions are exempted, but, but, but it, it at least suggests that maybe it's the, the, the poorer parts of society, that it's a regressive tax. Um, I think there's work to be done to really get underneath that. One has suspicions, but you know you need to get real evidence and really dig deeply to kind of better understand that. So my suspicion is that because it's a narrow tax, um, that it impacts bits of the society, a, a narrow levy, that it impacts bits of the society more than others, and that they're not necessarily the parts of, well, I mean, arguably, um, uh, it is at least regressive. Uh, Abdullah, do you want to do you want to come in on this? I think that taxing the charges would have been fairer, and I'm of the view that if you want to target the amount, then, like I said, the rate is on the high side because for countries that are taxing the amount of the transfer, the rates have been found to be between zero point two percent and zero point five percent. Those that are taking 1% and above are happen to be on the charges, which is why I explained that if you are imposing a tax, like Seth mentioned, is it on the income? Is it on an expense? Is it on an asset? So on what basis would you be levying on my amount as in a transfer? Because that has the tendency to lead to multiple taxation, as Seth mentioned. If I have to pay tax on my salary, and the remainder, the take-home pay, I need to remit to a sibling or a parent, and I have to pay e-levy on it, then I am being taxed twice on the same income for no value addition and no explanation to that effect. And that is why it will also affect a lot of issues to do with the, the digitalization agenda so that people would move from a cash economy to a cash light economy. So that will lead us to a whole lot of uh, drawbacks. As example, the underground economy, people will now find innovative ways of remitting to people without paying the tax. And in that case, you try to also limit the financial inclusion agenda of government because people are holding their money by way of a wallet in their pocket instead of going to the bank. So it's as if by money sitting in the bank, you are taxing it. Is that the case? Why would I be taxed when I have money on my mobile money and not in a bank account when I have to make a transfer? Why is the bank transfer taxable when it's above 20,000, but on my wallet, if it's above 100 Ghana CDs, I have to suffer the tax. Then it distorts the whole financial inclusion agenda and also trying to get people to move from the cash economy to a cash light economy. I just want to put a, a kind of a variant on on that point. The the point about um, about it, about payments coming out of tax income to Seth. Um, I know you were making the point earlier that that people pay 
tax on their income, at least people in the formal sector pay tax on, on the income that they receive. And that if they pay VAT as well, then that's an additional tax. If they pay this MOMO tax or this e-levy, um, it's an additional amount. Do you see it as any different, really? Um, I know the outcome will be different because the design is different. But do you see any difference, really, between um, having a 1.5% levy uh, on these payments and having an extra 1.5% on VAT? Suppose that the government of Ghana had decided to increase the rate of VAT by by one and a half percent. Would it have um, created similar issues? Would um, would that have been a similar problem? Why choose for a new levy? In um, when I worked as a policymaker in uh, in the UK government, we had a very simple rule that a new tax was a bad tax. You should use the existing framework of taxes if you possibly could, because the political reaction to a new tax was always going to be more severe than uh, an adjustment to an existing tax. Why not? Um, I mean, would the outcome have been a lot different if if another one and a half percent had been put on VAT? In principle, um, the rate is immaterial. Uh, but if, as a matter of experience, as I said, that you would want to, you know, plug a fiscal hole, then we have done that before. We've been doing it every time we go into an IMF program. We have two tax handles, temporary import duty, which we impose. You know, and then, um, you know, financial, we call it affluent fiscal stabilization, national stabilization, which is nothing more than, you know, the sector that's perceived to be making profit, like telcos or banks, and then they pay on their profits additional. But then it has a sunset clause. So after the crisis, you take it off. And that way, everybody comes to know that these are taxes that are associated, you know. But, you know, I, 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 I used to joke that, you know, when I started my career, I would I would normally go to the lorry station and look for somebody going home and give money to the person to give to my mother in the village. Um, Momo became a more convenient way of doing it. You know, and the guy who is sitting in the streets next to me knows my mother very well, you know, and can be, you know, confident that, you know, she'll receive her money. So what is it that you are, you are taxing? Now, I have another question. Is this a sector tax? And if it's a sector tax, Ghana has discovered oil. Are we going to therefore bring in all oil services, you know, and tax them, put, impose a levy, you know, on them? In reality, so for me, the issue is if we are targeting services, then the commission that is end, you know, yes, I'm preferring to, you know, uh, use a mobile phone instead of putting a bank instead of putting it in my pocket, you know, it is about services. They rope it into the VAT base because the VAT is all inclusive unless the sector is exempted. You know, <laughs> unless the sector is exempted. That's when we change the law. It used to be specific. These goods and these services will be taxed. We said, unless it's exempted, you know, it's taxable. So anytime it's so flexible, anytime there's a new sector coming, you know, you just look at the consumption, the expenditure. If there's an expenditure tax, and you rope it into the, the, the VAT base. That was so convenient. So construction emerged. Financial services, of course, as I said, you do have the difficulty of interest and the rest, the technical issue. But then not, what about the fees, you know, uh, 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 with their charging? So the commission of banks and the rest using ATM and all those, you know, would be a perfect substitute. And in my guess, would even bring in more, more revenue and less nuisance because another advantage is that the businesses will get input as credit. In this case, they are not getting put as credit and it's cascading and increasing and it's a part of the cost of the inflation, you know, that we are seeing today. So in principle, in short, in principle, I would say it's not necessary, irrespective of rates, but for fiscal exigencies, and I will be dishonest in saying that, you know, I didn't face as minister a crisis in which I brought in a temporary tax. So if we are bringing as a temporary tax, bring it in as a temporary tax, low rate with a sunset clause. At the end of three years, you take it off when the crisis would have been over. Yeah, <clears throat> unfortunately, governments 
tend not to have a very good record of um, of sticking to the rules when it comes to temporary taxes. Temporary taxes often turn out to be just a little bit more permanent than absolutely yes originally mentioned, and probably Ghana is uh, is one of the the countries in which that that has been an issue. But let me um, let me just turn to to one of the other questions, um, perhaps a couple a couple of questions that um, that have been posed that can perhaps be put together. Um, it's often said that uh, this kind of tax is a uh, puts a break on the the use and the extended use of digital services, um, and that it therefore stands in the way of progress. It stands in the way of the the rollout of digital services uh, by government as well as um, as within the private sector. Um, experience in some countries suggests that. When a tax or a levy like this is introduced, it has a, a temporary effect. In, in in Uganda, for example, as Eileen has mentioned, it had a um, it had a it caused a blip in the the growth of the use of mobile money in Uganda. It was a very narrowly focused tax, completely wrong in my view, but um, but that's beside the point. Um, the uh, the impact though was short lived, and when you look at current numbers for for the growth of mobile money services in Uganda, it continues to be spectacular. So, um, from what Eileen was saying earlier, I understand that um, the the Bank of Ghana is is saying that volumes of transactions have not changed significantly. Um, so perhaps people have not been put off so much from from this. Um, is there anecdotal evidence? Is there real evidence yet of people actually reverting to cash rather than um, rather than using mobile money as a as a means of payment? And um, do you think that um, do you think that perhaps uh, there is a strong sectoral lobby group that um, that influences people's views? in this area, in this area of taxation, more than perhaps in some other areas, um, such as fuel or um, or other services. Um, Abdullah, what do you what do you think? I think that the issue of financial inclusion has been on the agenda of the Ministry of Finance for a while, because If you look at the policy initiatives in 2020, which was the strategy, the digital financial services policy, and the cash light roadmap. Now, what this started doing for us was a reduction in the use of cash and people migrating more to the use of these digital services. Indeed, we had the rollout of the e-pharmacy, for example, where you need not walk to a pharmacy to order any medication. You could go on the you could go online, search for where the medication can be found, place your order, effect your transfer, and it is dropped at your doorsteps. The question is: if now I need to pay additional costs by way of e-levy then I'll rather walk to the pharmacy. And that whole idea of, of digitalization would suffer. And so we haven't yet had a comprehensive study on the impact, as the Bank of Ghana is saying. But at least they would also realize that if one of the objectives of the e-levy is to create jobs, it is also leading to unemployment because the aggregators, the agents are losing customers and so are unable to continue. And so if you are raising revenue to create jobs, to build entrepreneurship, and at the end of the day, all these people who are to be engaged in the mobile network space, the financial transaction space will be living. The other challenge we have is that the Bank of Ghana even posted announcements Remember, some people were borrowing on their mobile money networks. And then when there was the payment of e-levy and the re-registration of SIM cards, most people decided not to heed to the re-registration so that they get lost in the system and they cannot be traced for the recovery of the loans. Indeed, that is one good aspect of the financial inclusion where people could borrow on their mobile network. 
Now you bring e levy, they would not borrow. And those who have borrowed would go underground. And these fintech companies are likely to suffer a, a, a serious setback. So for me, those are challenges and those are studies we would need to undertake in terms of the quantum of, of reduction in the digital space, reduction in transactions and also the unemployment. There are still quite a lot of um, questions unanswered uh, at this point, but I unfortunately I need to move us on to um, to thoughts about what the government should do um, in relation to to the levy now. What the what are the steps that need to be taken? Um, is there a need, as Abdullah has been saying, for um, for some detailed studies to to work out what's happening in the market, what's happening? Um, uh, what impact is it is it having on um, on financial inclusion and, and such like? Um, is that the next step? Is and um, and if that's the next step, um, where do we think government should should go in terms of either changing or withdrawing the levy, or perhaps looking in in other directions for sources of funds? Um, Seth, uh, what do you think? Um, what do you think the the government should do about the levy, given the experience so far? Um, I know you've previously been a minister of finance, and so this has been very much in um, uh, very much your responsibility to make decisions about about what to do with this kind of levy, this kind of public reaction, this type of risk to market development and financial inclusion. What do you think um, the government uh, should do? I've always had a, a very basic principle, <laughs> you know, from my days, you know, the fund in particular, and other, you know, if there's an instrument that can do the job, you don't introduce another one because we haven't been discussing the administration cost theory, you know, of adapting the systems, you know, new forms, you know, new compliance systems and the rest enforcement. You know, when in actual fact, as I said, if what you are targeting, you know, in taxation is income, you know, um, expenditure, consumption, or property, you know, gain, you know, does it do the job? And if it's a sector that you want to target, you know, I'm saying the VAT law is all inclusive. And if you can do the job, you know, so I, I believe that we should also look at you know, in addition to the points, you know, made earlier, you know, value, we should also look at the cost of, you know, administration and compliance. And we should look at, you know, yes, I agree with Ali on uh, financial inclusion. You know, it's a very big agenda, not just for Ministry of Finance, but, by, you know, Bank of Ghana, right? The digital space is a, yeah, unfortunately, the digital issue we are talking about is a big agenda for the current government. You know, the vice president in Ghana uh, in particular has been, you know, you know, everywhere there must be digitization. Um, of course, I, I often joke that, you know, it is, uh, we used to call it automation, you know, electronic means and everything, you know, now apps, you know, are up. So, so I think that we should, in order to simplify as a emerging uh, middle income country, but substantively a developing country, we should keep the tax regime simple and not make it complex for both taxpayers and for the administration. You know, and that would be my, you know, my, you know, my view. So some study, you know, in, in the cost of compliance and in the even evasion and avoidance and all those things, you know, would be, you know, would be, uh, would be helpful, you know, in this regard. And let me mention that it was so quick while it was not just the Bank of Ghana and others that began to, the state, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, if you remember, you know, came out, you know, to say that they were in consultation you know, with investors and whatever, because if I took a loan from a bank or whatever, so so a number of institutions were, were taken a bit by surprise in the issue statements. And these are government institutions which didn't do, you know, go well at all for the reputation of government. Thank you very much. Eileen, I want to turn to you next. Uh, what recommendations would you want to make to, to the government of Ghana about the, the e-levy going forward? What I was saying about the Bank of Ghana is that they publish every month statistics about the, the markets and everybody can see those. If I can work out, I'll post a link in the chat. And what you can see is that broadly the figures haven't gone down. There was a, 
a blip around the time of implementation, but but it's stabilized. But of course, those are just headline figures. You you need to, as has been said, you need to get under uh, underneath it. And I don't really think it's for me to give um, advice to the government of Ghana about what to to do to do next. What I do believe, as a policymaker, so I'm not going to comment on the policy itself. That is really for the government to decide. But as a policymaker, my long experience, I've, I've, I've been doing this for a long time, is that you never ever regret having a good debate at the beginning. So strengthening the ability of, of, of strengthening your data collection processes, which there is work already happening on, strengthening your ability to, to gather the data, and then uh, making sure that there's a really robust process for challenge and debate at an early stage is how you get to having better policy. Um, and ideally, it, again, in my own personal experience, being part of a team where there are quite a few arguments in the beginning, it makes for better policy because by the time you finish, there's almost nothing that you haven't been through. So in terms of that, our role here is in Ghana is to, to support the, the uh, to provide additional support on request um, to policy making functions, to the ability to gather data, to, to, to helping people get uh, improve their <coughs> analytical skills and so on. And so that I think is probably where my role kind of rightly ends and it's for others to give advice directly on policy, I think. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Eileen. Um, I wasn't really thinking of you giving specific advice to the governments of Ghana, but it's legitimate for individuals to to have a point of view, a perspective on what could be done, what perhaps should be done, in um, in order to reshape a, a levy that's proving difficult, both from a, a revenue generation perspective and um, and from a, a kind of a public acceptance uh, perspective. And of course, I I mean, as you know. I'm very much a believer in discussion at the start of a uh, of a tax policy making process. I'm a huge believer in challenge at every level of um, of the policy making process. Challenge really sharpens you up, and there's nothing like criticism for um, for helping you to develop something that's a little bit better than you started with. Even though you know we're all human beings, and um, none of us like criticism, but we actually improve from it uh, as uh, as a rule and um and certainly policy making and policy outcomes generally improve from um from engagement of every form inclu including quite critical engagement um at an early stage there are obviously issues about whether you should change after the event and whether you should um be open to um to directed lobbying but that's that's a separate kind of issue abdullah i want to bring you in to to hear what your thoughts are um i'm not sure whether you'll want to advise the government of ghana or not or whether you'll want to to um to make direct suggestions about change but let me not speak for you and let me ask you <laughs> what you um what you think the the government ought to do now in the uh, in the current situation where the the levy is significantly underperforming from a, mm. a revenue perspective where volume of transactions doesn't appear to have changed so you know there's questions about the analysis that was done um the uh, what yeah what do you think should happen i think uh, from the policy perspective as you rightly said I have always posed a question that has been found very interesting and funny. We indicate that in any policy making process, you do stakeholder engagement. Here we are through a knee jerk reaction. We brought e levy and then we started doing what we call town hall meetings, doing stakeholder engagement. So I posed a question Do we get marriage before going for marriage counseling? or we go for married council before we get married <laughs> so here we are we are married we've imposed the levy and we are going for marriage counseling what if the priest says this marriage cannot stand would you withdraw the e-levy so i was thinking that after even these uh, town hall meetings and stakeholder engagement the question is what did you receive from stakeholders we've not had anything from all these engagements we should use that to revise the e-levy and know where to go because i think still the rate must come down to below one percent 
I think the threshold should be looked at and extended. And then all the concerns they may have picked through the engagement should be taken on board because, as I indicated, under the leadership of uh, Honorable Secretary as Finance Minister, he brought VAT on financial services. And when it was picking up was the time it was abolished, which is why I don't think this is a case to abolish another tax handle. We need to review it, revise it, take on board the concerns, and then reintroduce it. The same way we had VAT in 94, it was withdrawn, repackaged, consultation done, relaunched in 98, and it has been with us till date and performing. So I think that these reviews should be taken on board, all the concerns analyzed, and then we can still have a very good tax that even other countries we sought to look at uganda tanzania kenya may even come to look at what kind of model do we have and how did we make it successful otherwise if tanzania has abolished it would we also say we were copying them so we have to abolish it and if you abolish where else are you going to get it and that is where we find ourselves our government abolished 16 tax types upon coming into office without showing where else they were going to get the revenue and at the same time rolled out 16 flagship expenditure programs so you can see the whole has been there would be there and we need to find a way to deal with it excellent <clears throat> that's the perfect point at which to to end this session um i we're unfortunately out of time with there are a lot more questions that could have been answered but um will have to be answered by email and other means um i really want to thank the the panelists very much seth eileen abdallah um this has been a very interesting discussion very interesting opportunity to air some views and to to come to some con conclusions um i would like to thank the participants uh who've put forward the questions those who've simply taken part in um as uh as silent listeners to the um to the discussion that's taken place uh it's been extremely interesting thank you very much indeed all of you and thank you to the digitex team for in uh for setting up this event and organizing it thank you everyone